So I want to go on to a, a little bit of science. Um, and tonight I've chosen to focus on um, a couple of things in cosmology. So I'm not a cosmologist. That's not my uh, personal area of deep, deep expertise. But it's uh, where some of the really interesting SKA science lies. So I'll talk briefly about two things. Uh, one is probing the dark ages. And uh, the second thing will be uh, something about dark energy, which I think is possibly the most exciting thing that, that the SKA can tackle. Uh, so just before we do that, um, I have to go through a little bit of physics with you, just as background. Um, first bit of physics is this. <coughs> so hydrogen, the simplest element. One proton, one electron in its simplest form. Uh, there's a lot of it in the universe. The universe started out as uh, overwhelmingly hydrogen with just a, just a little dash of helium thrown in. So after the Big Bang cooled off, it was hydrogen that formed. And everything else formed from hydrogen. Most of the helium, carbon, nitrogen, oxygen, go through the entire periodic table. Um, comes after. And all of those elements were created when balls of hydrogen collapsed into stars, hydrogen burned into helium, helium burned into carbon, etc., etc. So everything that you and I are made of, everything that you can see around you, um, is the product of that stellar nucleosynthesis process, converting hydrogen into heavier elements. But even over the course of the universe, um, all of that conversion of hydrogen into other things has barely made a dent in the hydrogen. So the universe is mostly made of hydrogen. So it's a very, very fun fundamental um, element for astronomers. And it has a really, really beautiful property without which radio astronomy would be in deep trouble. So I've got a hydrogen atom here, proton, electron. And these particles have a property called spin, which is a, a, quantum, uh, a quantum mechanical property. So it turns out that if you have hydrogen atom where the spins of the proton and the electron are aligned, every once in a while, a few times within the age of the universe, those spins will just spontaneously flip a quantum mechanical process, completely random, spontaneous. And it flips into this configuration where the spins are anti-parallel. And it turns out that this is a lower energy state than this. So the excess energy has to uh, leave the system. And the excess energy leaves the system as a radio photon with a very, very, very specific frequency. So it produces radiation at 1.420406 approximately gigahertz. That's around about a wavelength of about 21 centimetres. Very, very famous uh, radio emission in radio astronomy. So if we tune our radio telescopes to 1.42 gigahertz, we can directly observe hydrogen. And here's a map of the, the hydrogen gas in our galaxy. So again, here's the plane of the galaxy where most of the hydrogen sits. So keep that in mind, that this is a very, very useful property of hydrogen for radio astronomers. So I also need to introduce a concept called redshift. Uh, this is something that you are all familiar with. Uh, if you've been out on the street and you've had a police car or an ambulance scream past you with its siren on, you'll notice that when you're in front of the car, you hear a very high-pitched siren. As soon as the car passes you and you're behind the car, the pitch uh, drops dramatically. This is because when you're in front of the car, the car is actually catching up to the waves that the siren emits. 
and so the waves get bunched up and you get a high frequency sound, high pitch. The opposite occurs in the opposite direction. The car is racing away from the waves it emits and so the wavelength is uh, much longer and that, that gives a low frequency and a lower pitch. This is a, an effect called the Doppler shift. Um, so it's exactly the same in astrophysics, except we can use the, uh, the signals from, the radio signals from hydrogen gas instead of a siren, and a galaxy instead of the car, and we stay where we are on Earth. So because the universe is expanding, uh, galaxies at different distances are moving with different speeds, and the emission that comes from these galaxies when it's received back at the Earth at our telescope is going to have a different frequency. So if we're looking at a galaxy that's right next door to our Milky Way galaxy, relative speed of zero kilometres per second, we point a radio telescope at it, we see hydrogen at 1.4 gigahertz. If we look at a more distant galaxy, say this one, that has a speed of 100,000 kilometres per second relative to us, due to the expansion of the universe, we point our telescope at it, look at hydrogen, and we find that it pops up at 1 gigahertz, not 1.4, and so on and so forth. At a faster speed, a bigger distance, uh, the frequency received on the Earth drops. So this is, this is the fundamental observation that Edwin Hubble made back in the 1920s when he looked at galaxies realised that the light from the galaxies was redshifted and said, aha, the, the universe is expanding. So this is direct evidence of, a, of an expanding universe. And most of cosmology, uh, cosmology being the detailed understanding of the structure of the universe, the space-time geometry of the universe, most of cosmology boils down to understanding the relationship between distance and redshift. So the different uh, cosmological models predict different things about the relationship between distance and redshift. And telescopes like the SKA will uh, make observations that test those models. So first, so with that little bit of physics background, I'll first talk about um, looking at the dark ages of the universe. So here again is a, a schematic. We have the Big Bang. After a tiny fraction of a second, the universe expanded uh, very, very quickly, a period known as inflation. During that time, the universe was completely composed of fully ionised um, uh, atoms, so basically free protons and free electrons, and also radiation all mixed up together, incredibly hot soup of material. So hot and so dense that if a, radi if a, if a uh, photon or um, some radiation propagated through the universe, it could only move a very small distance before colliding with a particle, being scattered, shot off in another direction, reabsorbed. So it was this massive mess. After about 300,000 years, the universe had cooled and expanded to a point where the electrons and the protons could um, combine to form hydrogen, which is a neutral material. As soon as that happened, the radiation was then free to propagate for very, very long distances. So it was no longer constrained as part of this fully ionised soup. Uh, so as soon as the radiation started propagating, um, it could travel through the rest of the universe and after 13.7 billion years it can reach us to be looked at with a radio telescope. So this is what you get when you look at this uh, radiation that's left over from this uh, period in the universe. So this is the cosmic microwave background. Uh, a map made with a radio telescope in Earth orbit. And these little fluctuations um, 
of very, very fine density perturbations left over from that period. When the universe was this soup of material, there were all sorts of sloshing back and forth of the material, uh, sort of like waves. They're called uh, acoustic os oscillations. You can think of them as, as waves on the surface of a lake. And the material sloshed around like mad, but as soon as the material became neutral and the radiation couldn't drive that sloshing, the last moment of those waves was frozen in. And so this is the, the frozen in imprint of the last state of that oscillation. Uh, and and it's, the, it's the imprint that all of the structure formation in the universe followed after that. So these tiny little density fluctuations grew into clusters of galaxies um, and superclusters of galaxies. But all of that neutral material was left behind. All of that hydrogen uh, was left with this imprint. And it took some time to start forming stars and start forming galaxies. Had to be had to collapse gravitationally, take some time. After some time, the stars and galaxies formed, and started uh, radiating their own light at radio wavelengths and at optical wavelengths. And by the time you get to the present day, we're sort of surrounded by galaxies. So you can use uh, all sorts of telescopes to look back a long way into the universe. But with an optical uh, telescope, you can never <coughs> look back to that time in the early universe before the stars and galaxies are actually formed because they're emitting no visible light. But it's all hydrogen, right? Which is very convenient for radio astronomers because we can detect hydrogen because it has this spin-flip transition that allows us to look at it. So with the SKA, it will be big enough to directly observe that hydrogen gas um, millions to a billion year, years after the Big Bang in its phase of forming the first generation of stars and galaxies. And it will be the only instrument uh, capable of doing this. Uh, remember the redshift? So uh, by the time the 1.4 gigahertz radiation gets to the Earth, it's redshifted down to 100 megahertz. So the SKA goes down to 100 megahertz and it has enough collecting area enough sensitivity that it can see back to that period in the universe. Right, this is where I need to take a deep, bre deep breath and wrap a cold towel around my head um, because dark energy, uh, which is a bit of a mystery. So um, it starts with a bit of a history lesson. In 1917, everyone thought that the universe was static. That is, that the galaxies were fixed, nothing really changed. Uh, this worried Einstein because his formulation of the equations of general relativity uh, predicted that in that state, the universe should just collapse. So how did we all manage to be here in a universe that's not collapsed? And he introduced into his equations um, an ad hoc element called a cosmological constant, which had the effect of maintaining a static universe against gravity, sort of an anti-gravity uh, constant. Around about uh, 12, ye 12 years later, uh, Edwin Hubble uh, was releasing the results of his studies over the, um, over the last few years, in which he directly obtained evidence that, in fact, all of the galaxies were rushing apart from each other. The universe is not static at all. At which point Einstein called the co cosmological constant his greatest blunder because it wasn't needed, never was needed. It was just simply that they lacked the observational understanding of the universe. So he threw it away and felt quite bad about it. However, some 70 years later, in the late 1990s, some really startling uh, observations were made of supernovae exploding stars in other galaxies that you can see to very large distances, therefore very high redshifts. And uh, it's alleged that every supernova has the same brightness because it's the same underlying physical principle that causes the star to explode and releases the same amount of energy each time. 
So if you look at these things at different distances, they should follow a well-known um, increasing in dimness. So they should get fainter according to a, a certain uh, relationship. But what these guys found was that that relationship didn't hold. And they surmised that the universe is actually uh, expanding faster and faster as the universe gets older and older um, due to some unseen uh, additional force that's not understood by physics and they called it dark energy. So this looks very much like a cosmological constant and so people were saying, well, perhaps Einstein is, was right all along and we, we actually do need this cosmological constant. So just last week, actually, there were some new results uh, released from a, a team at Swinburne University that basically confirms that dark energy exists and suggests strongly that it can be uh, explained in terms of Einstein's equations for gravity with a cosmological constant added. And the bottom line is where we want to be at in sort of 15 years' time. That is the SKA measuring this in detail, uh, looking at dark energy, back to sort of 9.5 billion years in the universe. So, okay, why is that interesting? Who cares? Dark energy, so what? So there were two explanations for these observations. Explanation one was just that Einstein was wrong and his, uh, his theories needed modification. The second explanation, which looks to be the right one, is that Einstein was actually right, but uh, there's a new and unseen particle or field that pervades space and is a force that counters gravity and pushes the galaxies further and further apart, faster and faster as the universe evolves. So that can take the form of the cosmological constant in, in Einstein's equations and equates to a what we call a non-zero vacuum energy. So in quantum mechanics, all the time around you in every volume of space, particles are being created and destroyed. And we never see them because they're created, they're destroyed virtually instantaneously. This is happening all around us, the theorists tell us. Uh, but the key is that whatever's created is always destroyed. So it's a net energy gain zero. So if you had slightly more things created than were destroyed, you'd have a non-zero uh, energy input into the vacuum. Uh, and that would be something that would push space apart and create something that looks like this dark energy. So that's a really, that's a really massive revision of the laws of physics, if such a thing were possible. Because for the first time, we have observational evidence of something that connects gravity with subatomic physical processes, that is quantum mechanics. So the unification of gravity and quantum mechanics has been the holy grail of physics for the last 50 years. And dark energy looks like it could be the key to understanding how gravity and quantum mechanics are related to each other. So we know, that he, we know that dark energy exists. We've got no idea where it comes from. Could be the vacuum of space, could be a non-zero vacuum energy. How is it created? How is it related to quantum mechanics? How does it evolve over the history of the universe? So we know this stuff exists. And in fact, we have a pretty good idea that dark energy makes up 74% of the mass energy content of the universe another 20 odd percent in something that's called dark matter, which is also very, very poorly understood. And this tiny sliver up the top is you and I. That's the atomic material, atoms, molecules, proteins, wood, steel, flesh, everything that you ever see around you and are ever going to see is only 4% of the, the universe. So 96% of the universe we really don't understand, in particular the 74% dark energy. So the SKA is going to search for this dark energy. Uh, the Large Hadron Collider 
is going to search for dark energy. So the SKA is taking an astronomical scale approach by looking for the effects of dark energy over cosmological distances. The LHC is going to search for it by smashing particles together really hard and seeing what comes out. So we're sort of looking in the face of the first really major revision of the laws of physics for the last 70 or 80 years. So the last revolution in physics was um, our understanding of quantum mechanics, mainly through the 1920s and 1930s. And many people say, yes, well, this is all very nice. It's all highly esoteric. So what? Who cares about quantum mechanics? Well, I'd simply say that every single electronic device that we use, uh, the tens or hundreds of trillions of dollars in the electronics industry and the productivity gains that, that we have by using computers and all manner of modern devices are only possible because we understand quantum mechanics. So that's a, a tens of trillions of dollar a year industry that didn't exist 100 years ago and only exists because we understand the fundamental laws of physics, in particular quantum mechanics in that case. And this, this has always happened over history. You make a fundamental advance in science and everyone thinks it's esoteric. But sooner or later, maybe after decades, clever people figure out what this actually means, how to build uh, new and better technology. And that's what's happened with quantum mechanics and other, other sciences. So unify, un, unifying uh, gravity and quantum mechanics might sound esoteric, but whenever you're revising the laws of physics, you're not quite sure what that's going to bring in 50 years' time or 100 years' time. So these are the really fundamental advances that are at the absolute core of technology. So some people like that, some people like me just like to understand how the universe works. So how is the SKA going to do this? Um, so I might spend just a, a minute or two explaining. So you'll recall that I said that cosmology boils down to uh, finding out the relationship between redshift and distance. So this curve is the prediction of Einstein's equations with a cosmological constant included. And currently we have three observational data points. Um, this was released last week and is the result of five years' work by a team of roughly 20 people who looked at a quarter of a million galaxies. So all of that work boiled down to one data point on a graph. Happily, it agrees with the theoretical curve. So indications are that Einstein's theory of gravity is correct and we need something like a vacuum energy in the form of a cosmological constant to um, explain the observations. It's quite interesting uh, how you go about this observation. So here we have the microwave background again and from this you can figure out that um, things in the universe have a preferential clustering scale. So they have a small preference for being at a certain distance from each other compared to other distances. And you can basically measure that that's measured in the imprint of the cosmic microwave background. And then that distance stays constant over the evolution of the universe. So it's like having a standard ruler. So if you've got a 30 centimetre ruler and you put it at different distances, it appears to have a different size. So you can measure the angular extent of that ruler. You know how long it is. So simple geometry, you can figure out its distance. So you do this by looking at galaxies over the history of the universe and so you measure the angular size of this ruler and you measure the redshift of the galaxies that form that ruler. From that you can form the, the redshift distance relationship and that's how these three observational data points were formed. So this was, this was made with about a quarter of a million galaxies. The SKA will do this properly with a billion galaxies. 
So you won't be just getting one data point on this curve, you'll be getting high precision stuff. This cuts off at about 6 billion uh, light years uh, back in time. SKA will go out to something like 10 billion light years. So you get a very high precision measurement um, and hopefully understand uh, a lot more about the nature of the dark energy.